Hi everyone, this is Ernie. Ernie is a pandemic cat. His full name is Detective Chief Inspector Mr. Ernie Cactus Pants. But I digress. The point of the lecture today, we're continuing to talk about association learning, and we're gonna talk about Pavlovian conditioning. You probably have heard about Pavlov and his dog. You know, Pavlov trained a dog to associate the sound of a tone with getting food reward. And I just wanna demonstrate some of these principles here today. So here we have a piano and I've got some cats and I'm going to play a sound. Now what happened? I mean not much. This is a, a sound stimulus but it's a neutral stimulus for the cats. They, they haven't learned that whenever I play this sound they get treats because I haven't given them treats every time I play that sound. Let me show you a different sound that is associated with the cats getting treats. It's the sound of the treat bag. And here's the bag of treats. Now, if I shake this bag of treats, the cats are gonna hear this sound. And let's see what happens. There's one cat. Oh, there's the other one. All right, so that's just a quick demonstration of Pavlovian conditioning. These cats didn't respond uh, to the piano sound. They hadn't learned that they would get treats with that. But as soon as I shook that treat bag, they heard that and came running right away for the treats. We'll talk more about this in the lecture today. See you there. Well, you know what? Um, this came in the mail. Literally like 20 minutes after I finished recording the video with those puzzle boxes and the cats, I got another puzzle box. It's way bigger. It would have been better to use for that previous mini lecture. No matter, today we are on a different topic related to associations. It's the last part of our uh, learning modules on associative learning. We're going to be talking about Pavlov's classical conditioning. This may well be a familiar concept to you. We've got a few goals today. One, I'm going to do a little bit of historical background, very brief, leading into Pavlov's work. We will review what his procedure was and what he found. So if you don't know what classical conditioning is now, you will by the end of this lecture. And um, we're going to focus on two other things. One, we will think about how results from classical conditioning procedures can be used to make inferences about the nature of processes involved with association formation. And finally, we will talk about some examples where what Pavlov was doing with animals, uh, the principles of that stuff seems to apply in a lot of different places, including really different kinds of places in human cognition, having to do with things as seemingly different as drug tolerance behavior and perception of colors. Let's get into it. Here's Ivan Pavlov. He was a Russian physiologist. He discovered classical conditioning and got the Nobel Prize for it in 1904. He was a contemporary of Edward Thorndike. They were both looking at associative processes in animals at around the same time. Just like in the last mini lecture, I brought up uh, some antecedents or some precedents, <laughs> some early research work from philosophy. Um, and I'll do that again here. So Ivan Pavlov was inspired by some of Rene Descartes' writings. And Descartes wrote about reflexes. I'm sure you know what a reflex is. You might be familiar with the knee reflex. Here's a picture of it. So if you've ever tapped your knee right in the right spot, just hit it. Uh, if you activate the reflex, your leg will just kind of automatically bounce up a little bit. There isn't much you can do about this. You can think, well, maybe I don't want to do that with my leg. No matter, this little reflex will kick in and cause your leg to go like that. So Rene knew about these reflexes and he was thinking about them uh, metaphorically because he had an example in mind, um, this thing called the Garden at St. Germain. It was a garden of his time, 
and it had apparently a really incredible plumbing situation. Here's a picture of it. We could see there's maybe some fountains and stuff and there's trees and a big garden. It's a pretty nice looking garden to me. One of the apparently uh, notable features of this garden was these statues. The statues would be connected inside with hoses and stuff like that. And so if you squished water through the hoses, that could like make an arm go like this or make it maybe make it like a dolphin go like that or something. So it had like this mechanized statue system. And the plumbing required to move water through these statues and make them make movements was pretty complicated for the time. Probably would be complicated for now. And what Descartes was thinking, he was making an analogy between this incredible garden and the brain. And he was, he, he wrote about the brain trying to think about like, well, how, how does human and animal behavior work? You know, maybe it's got a plumbing system that's kind of like this amazing garden, but it's just even more complicated. So he describes a picture of the brain here as a system of tubes where you know, liquid gets pushed through the tubes. All the tubes are connected to each other in the right ways to cause things like your arms to move around, just like these statues in the garden. So there's a philosopher thinking about some ways in which uh, humans and animals might work. And we have physiologists much later reading Descartes and talking about learning more about these tube systems in our brain. So here, here we have Pavlov, uh, a quote from, uh, from his work, just before he starts talking about classical conditioning and how he discovered it, he says, our starting point has been Descartes' idea of the nervous reflex. This is a genuine scientific conception since it implies necessity. It may be summed up as follows. An external or internal stimulus falls on some one or another nervous receptor and gives rise to a nervous impulse. This nervous impulse is transmitted along nerve fibers to the central nervous system, and on account of the existing nervous connections, it gives rise to a fresh impulse, which passes along outgoing nerve fibers to the active organ where it excites a special activity of the cellular structures. Finally, when a stimulus appears to be connected, uh, Oh, sorry, let me repeat that. Thus, a stimulus appears to be connected of necessity with a definite response as cause is with effect. For, for Pavlov, he was thinking that associations between a sound or any other stimulus can be connected through a series of tubes, just like in this uh, Descartes garden, somehow, some special way, uh, that when the stimulus goes off, it sets in motion all these connections that pass physiologically, like these are physiological connections, they're real physical structures, and the impulses go through the tubes in your body, and they end up, you know, doing the thing that they do. It's just like as if you push water through real tubes, the water has to go somewhere, it goes to the end of the tube, it, it, whatever the water hits causes the next thing to happen and so on. So Pavlov is thinking just like Descartes here, and he has this general goal of trying to learn more about, well, if we think there's these physical connections between a, something like a stimulus that you experience from the world and your response to that stimulus, how, how can we learn more about how those physical connections get established and how they actually allow a stimulus response connection to be made. Pavlov didn't work out totally how the brain works, but he did describe uh, a procedure to demonstrate the acquisition or learning of new stimulus response associations in animals. Let's make sure we're, and we're going to cover what that procedure is right away. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to point out there's going to be some terms we need, we need to make sure we cover what they are. So the UCS, that stands for the unconditioned stimulus, the UCR, the unconditioned response, the CS, 
is a conditioned stimulus in the CR conditioned response. In general, a stimulus is something like a sound. It could be anything. It could be uh, a color, a tap. A response is the thing you do, a behavior emitted in response to that stimulus. What does unconditioned and conditioned mean? Let's get into that. We will start with a simple acquisition procedure. I've got, uh, let's, let's read this first and then take a look at this cartoon that I drew to explain simple acquisition. So here's the idea. In a sim simple acquisition procedure, you can repeatedly pair a reward stimulus like food with a neutral stimulus like a tone. And I'm talking about uh, having an animal, say like Ernie from before, or a dog, or a, an, another kind of animal. And what we're going to do is present that animal with the reward stimulus and the neutral stimulus at the same time. So you might hear a tone and get some food. That's a pairing. And you do that a whole bunch of times. This is called the acquisition process, the multiple pairings of the reward stimulus and the neutral stimulus. Before you've done all these pairings, um, what we find is the food itself already causes certain reactions in the animal. If you give some food to a dog, it will start salivating. So the food seems to act as a stimulus that causes the dog to salivate. What's curious is that after you do this thing here, repeatedly pair reward stimulus, like food, with something else, like a tone, um, the tone can now cause the dog to, to salivate. So after acquisition, the tone causes salivation. And the food still does too, but, but this neutral stimulus, this sound that previously didn't cause the dog to salivate is now causing the dog to salivate, apparently. And when I say apparently, I mean uh, apparently causing. Here's a little picture to describe this whole situation. So before acquisition, we have uh, these two things to talk about. The first thing is we have our reward stimulus. This is called an unconditioned stimulus or a UCS. When we, when we present this to an animal like a dog, it will elicit what's called the unconditioned response or the UCR. Simply, the food will cause this dog to salivate. So we've got the tongue out there. At the same time, you could go find some other stimulus that doesn't really do anything. Kind of like when I played the piano note earlier. If we just play some tone for this dog, it doesn't do anything. So the dog seems to like the food, salivates, give it a tone, doesn't really do anything. That's before the acquisition procedure. Let's take a look at the acquisition procedure. It's right here. Just this one. Now, during the acquisition phase, there is a pairing of the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimuli. In other words, the tone and the food are paired together. So every time the dog gets the food, here's the tone. And of course, we already know what happens when the dog gets the food. The dog does a little bit of salivating. Now, after a bunch of repeated pairings, this is the interesting thing that happens called classical conditioning. The tone that was previously neutral, it previously, previously didn't do anything to this dog. It has changed. It is no longer a neutral stimulus. We'll call it a conditioned stimulus. And why do we call it that? Because after the acquisition phase, 
this tone will actually elicit the conditioned response. That is, when the dog hears the tone, it will start salivating. We saw an example in the beginning uh, when I pressed the piano key, the cats didn't come running. They don't care about the piano key sound. But when I shook the bag of treats, you know, they've had a lot of time to learn that the bag of treats means they're going to get a treat. And so they came running. So the uh, sound of the bag of treats was previously a neutral stimulus. And after being paired with actually eating those treats, it, it's become a conditioned stimulus that elicits a conditioned response. And that response for those cats could have been running towards me to get that food. So let's consider some questions of cognition here. What kind of association was learned? Did the tone make the animal expect to receive food? And was it the expectation for food that evoked salivation? Does the tone cause the animal to mentally simulate eating food? Does the tone directly cause salivation without causing an expectation for food? What's going on between hearing that tone and that salivation response? Now, we're not going to answer these questions today, but I want to connect the questions to the procedure. So if, if we, uh, and let's do that another time to give, to give you an example. So I'm going to tell, tell you about a second procedure that Pavlov figured out, and it's called extinction. It's related to another question we might have. Clearly, we can make new associations between something like a neutral stimuli, like a tone, and a food reward. Once a new as association has been established, can we unlearn it? That's the question that's being asked in an extinction procedure. So here's a picture of both an acquisition phase and an extinction phase. They're very similar. During the acquisition trials, you would pair a neutral stimulus and a food reward, let's say, together many times. And across the pairings, if you were to measure the salivation response um, alone, that is, sorry, when you only present the tone, you'll, you'll see that the, the tone will elicit the salivation response at a high level after this association has been acquired. In an extinction phase, what happens is the conditioned stimulus or the tone is presented by itself for many times. So this tone no longer gets paired with food. The question is, what happens to the association between the tone and the food? And I've, I've sort of indicated that in the picture. What actually happens is that over time, the presentation of the tone will elicit a smaller and smaller conditioned response. So in this case, the conditioned response is the salivation response. And when you start just presenting the tone a bunch of times, the animal stops salivating to it. To give you another example, let's go back to those cats. You know, if I was to be really mean and find something like that treat bag and shake it and never give my cats treats again, but I would go in that same location and keep shaking that bag, you know what, what would happen, I think, according to the concept of extinction, is the cats would come running down the hallway a couple times, maybe four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve times. But eventually they'd be like, forget this, I'm not getting any food. So the response of running towards the sound to get the treats, they would stop doing that. They would apparently, what, unlearn the association between the sound and getting the food reward. But actually, um, let's ponder that a little bit more. So extinction does occur, but 
we still have questions about what happened. Did the original association between the tone and food become weakened or eliminated? Is that what extinction did? Did the animal learn to suppress its expectation for food? How about maybe the animal learned a new association? So it actually has two associations. One is this sound means I'm going to get food. They learned that. And they also learned that this sound means I'm not going to get food. And they have both of those things. All right, I'm going to try to explain a, a simple theory of association formation with uh, this little object lesson here. So I have some paper towel. And this is a picture of a note or a tone, and it's connected. There's two pieces of towel here. So it's connected to this food. You know, in a previous situation, I paired the tone with the food a lot. And so it created this really strong association. So this is a physical metaphor for an association because this top towel is literally connected to the bottom towel. So it's totally associated by a physical bond. So what happens um, when we do an extinction procedure? What happens to the association between something like this tone and this food? Is the association like a physical bond, just like this paper towel? Let's consider the idea. So we're going to put this association through extinction. We're just going to present this tone alone, never with food. All right. Now here's a metaphor for what might be happening to the association uh, as it, as we only present the tone and never present it with food. This might get weakened. And so, as you can see, it's sort of breaking apart. So the connection between this tone and the food, is getting weaker as I extinguish it. And uh, maybe hanging on by a thread here. If I go back to, uh, let me just quickly make it one. I think I got it here. I can, nope, let's go back to this. Yeah, that works. And look at, sorry, this one here. So we might be really far down in the extinction trials. We've only seen the tone many times by itself. And finally, the, the association with food just goes away. So it's broken right off. That means that whenever the animal sees the tone, what kinds of associations come along with it? Nothing. This is not dragging up memories of food because it's not connected to the food association anymore. So one possibility is that during the extinction procedure, associations do become completely unlearned and the bonds between one thing and another become torn apart, just like a string would be cut or these two paper towels would be pulled apart. Now it's possible that some kinds of associations might be unlearned in such a way. However, and this is one thing that's pretty cool about the classical conditioning research that Pavlov did. He did more experiments and some of the data from the later experiments suggested that this simple physical bond metaphor uh, didn't really account for how associative learning works. Let me give you an example. And it has to do with something called spontaneous recovery. Spontaneous recovery is the observation that an extinguished stimulus response association can suddenly reappear completely spontaneously. So what does that mean? Well, you know, we're thinking about this as these towels. So let's do this again. When my cats hear that sound, they come running down the stairways or running down the hallway because they know they're going to get that food. So when they hear the sound, they're expecting that food. If I was to do that thing that was very mean and never pair the sound with the food again, just let them 
hear the sound of the trees many, many times, many times, and extinguish the association between the sound and the food. Eventually, when they hear the sound, they won't come running. These two things will not be connected. And so if those two things are not connected, and if I'm sitting in that chair and I shake the bag sometime in a month from now, they should never come running down the hallway expecting this food. They shouldn't spontaneously just like have that association again because we got rid of it, right? We disconnected the association. If we disconnected the association, how could they spontaneously recover it? Thing is, that's what animals will do. They will spontaneously recover previously extinguished associations. That's very interesting, and it provides uh, some counterpoints to potential explanations on how associative learning works. So we just went through that example to illustrate how a series of empirical observations, observations about simple acquisition, about extinction, and about spontaneous recovery, can be used to make inferences about the underlying processes of association formation. I suggested at the beginning of this lecture that classical conditioning phenomena is also relevant for human cognition. Here's an interesting paper. This one is called Learning and Homeostasis, Drug Addiction and the McCullough Effect by Shep Siegel and Lorraine Allen, published in Psych Bulletin in 1998. These two things are very different. One is about drug addiction. The other one is about the McCullough effect, which I'll show you in a moment. This is a, a, a color illusion. And in this paper, they suggest that principles of Pavlovian conditioning that we just learned about are important for both of these very different kinds of phenomena. To talk about the, uh, what is it, the drug addiction issues, this is another paper by Shep Siegel called Heroin Overdose Death, Contribution of Drug-Associated Environmental Cues, published in Science in 1982. It talks about how conditioning processes may be important for understanding drug tolerance issues. I don't have time to go into this paper, which is very short and also very, very interesting. However, if you're interested in learning more, uh, there's a writing assignment for this learning module that has to do with learning about this paper. So go check that one out. On the very other side, in, uh, in a, sorry, in a very different situation, we have um, evidence that classical conditioning plays a role in certain perceptual effects. And Alan and Siegel have another paper where they talk about the McCullough effect potentially as a conditioned response. The McCullough effect is something that I will try to prepare a demonstration for the class. I will briefly explain what it is here. It's also very interesting. What we're looking at are two inducer stimuli. The one on the left is just some horizontal bars. They're black and red. And the one on the right, some vertical bars, black and green. In a proper demonstration of this, you would be sitting in a dark room and you would be staring at each of these one at a time, okay? And what this will do is it will basically make a little imprint on your visual system. Before I go on to the next slide, the McCullough effect is all about something called a color after effect illusion. If you've ever stared at a color for a while and then say looked away maybe at a white wall just like this white screen, and if you ever see like the remnants of that, you could see a after effect or like a kind of funny color on the wall. Uh, that's what this effect's all about. So if you, for example, if you stare at something that's really, really red, you might see something kind of like a little bluey greeny on the white wall afterwards. 
All right. Uh, but that's not the whole story. With the McCullough effect, we're going to stare at this red and horizontal bars for a while. We're going to stare at these green and vertical bars for a while. And then take a look at these white and black bars. And what the McCullough effect is, is conditional. Uh, it's a demonstration that your after effects, your color after effects, will actually be context specific. You'll get one color after effect for the horizontal lines, which were paired with these red bars, and you'll get a different color after effect for these vertical bars, which were paired with these green ones. And it's very interesting to actually see it happen. I don't think it'll work that well in this video. Uh, so I'm going to try to make something available on the website for you to check this out. If you just go to the slides, you can see these stimuli. And one way to try it yourself is just load up these slides, stare at the, let me see if I can do it with my hands, stare at the red one for 10 seconds, then stare at the green one for 10 seconds, then stare at the red one for 10 seconds, and go back and forth for a minute and really just focus on those things. And once you're ready, move one slide forward. And the question is, can you see like little hints of green as a color after effect for the vertical bars and a little hints of reddish kind of colors for the, for the vertical bars? Did I say that right? These ones are horizontal, those ones are vertical. You're supposed to see different color after effects. What's the relation to Pavlovian conditioning? Well, what you've been doing in this procedure, the idea is you've been uh, pairing horizontal bars with the perception of red and pairing the vertical bars with the perception of green. It's not the whole story. The way the visual system works, it has these opponent color systems. And so when you take away the red and the green and you just show the horizontal bars, uh, what appears to be happening is there is a learned, conditioned response at play. When you look at the horizontal bars, you can think about this like the, like the tone in a Pavlovian experiment. It's retrieving an association to the color after effect um, for these bars. So the color after effect for red is kind of a greenish thing that you would see here. And similarly, when you look at the vertical bars as a stimulus, it's retrieving a learned association to the opposite color of green. So you see that color effect here, it's kind of a ready thing. That's it for our learning module on associations. We will continually come back to associations throughout the course because it's such a core concept in psychology and certainly in cognition. We'll be wondering about what are associations and how are they formed and how are they made? We'll be thinking about that in the context of memory research, in the context of language research, and many other domains besides associative learning proper. So what's next? You should finish the readings for this chapter. If you haven't done so, watch the other mini lecture. If you're done, then go ahead and complete the quiz and or any other assignments you want by the due date. And then take a break and start the next learning module when you're ready.